Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Stephen Fluin. Uh, I am a developer advocate on the Angular team at Google. Um, so a lot of people say, what is a developer advocate? What does that mean? Um, so I'm an engineer uh, with really two missions. My first mission is to help developers, organizations, companies building things with Angular be successful. And then the other half of my mission uh, is really to understand the experience that developers go through every day when it comes to building applications. I need to understand the opportunities that they have, the challenges that they face, all of the problems that they encounter, so that I can reflect all of those needs and all of those uh, opportunities within the Angular team to make sure that we're building the right thing uh, in the right way to make Angular better and to make uh, web development better in general. Uh, so to get us all a little bit on the same page, uh, I want to talk just uh, briefly about what Angular is. So uh, before I even start here, how many people are familiar with Angular? OK, basically everyone here. That's great to see. Uh, now, of those people who are familiar with Angular, how many people here have built something with Angular 2 here? OK, quite a few of you. So uh, there will be a little bit to learn here, because I'm really talking about how uh, Angular uh, plays when it comes to web applications being run on mobile. Um, so I, I always want to come back to uh, part of how I perceive the Angular mission. And so uh, there, there's a few kind of versions of these running around. But to me, Angular exists to make building applications with the web easy. And so these words have been chosen relatively carefully um, just because, uh, for example, you see the word web in there. Uh, when I talk about web, I'm saying web technologies. So for example, JavaScript, uh, ES6, TypeScript, kind of all of these technologies that have been driven by and primarily used by the web uh, but not necessarily, because the, the other part of Angular uh, is that Angular is really meant to be run everywhere. So uh, in kind of the history of Angular, we had Angular 1 for a long time, uh, one of the most popular frameworks ever for building applications. Uh, but then what happened was we started building things at scale. Companies had not just one or two Angular projects, but they had 100. Uh, and things, uh, the cracks started to show in Angular 1. And so uh, the team decided that a new approach was needed a little bit. We wanted to take the same philosophies, and so they started working a few years ago on Angular 2. Um, and so we were fortunate enough in uh, September of this year to actually have the, the kind of first final release of Angular. Uh, so we had 2.0.0, which we were all very excited to, to share with the world. Um, and since then, we've seen kind of thousands of developers, millions of developers, um, taking a look at Angular 2 and saying, hey, what is this? How is it different? Um, the two biggest things that I'll call out, um, and there's, there's a number of diff important differences between the two. Uh, number one has been a focus on performance. And then number two has been this idea of DOM independence. And so Angular 1 basically did a lot of things where it would take uh, a string or a set of HTML and it would pass it into the web browser and say, hey, please figure out how this needs to be rendered on the, the page. But a an important design goal of Angular 2 was that Angular doesn't just run in the browser anymore. We can actually now run Angular uh, in more pure environments, whether it's server, whether it's mobile, and then have a render target that, ends at, that may end up being the browser, but may end up being something else. And I'll, I'll get into this and give a, a few examples of this. So this talk is roughly going to have four sections. Uh, first, I want to talk about the importance of mobile experiences in terms of when it, uh, how you connect to your users and uh, your audience. Second, I want to talk about Angular's mobile ecosystem. So really all of the different tools that we are thinking about and all of the things that are at your disposal to be building these great experiences. Uh, then I'll give some guidance in terms of a uh, framework for thinking about how to decide uh, what you want to do when it comes to building an application and shipping it on mobile. And then we're going to get a little bit risky and we're going to try some live coding and we'll actually try and build and launch an application on mobile. So I wanted to start off talking about mobile experiences. So when I first started talking about mobile more than 10 years ago, I had to ask a question. I said, how many people here have a smartphone? But I, I don't ask that question anymore, because that's a stupid question now. right? Everyone has a smartphone. Everyone here probably also has a laptop and possibly even a tablet. And so I think we all see these devices, and we start using them. And we know how important they are, but we don't often take a, a moment to really reflect on that in terms of what it means to us. Um, I remember that when I started using a 10-inch tablet, for example, my thought was, oh, is this going to replace my laptop? And unfortunately, it didn't, right? And then I started using a 7-inch tablet. I said, oh, is this going to replace my 10-inch tablet? And it didn't. What ended up happening was my, my mobile experience, my mobile use cases, kept fragmenting further and further, where I would always want to be reaching for the right device at the right time. 
And because of the pervasiveness of these mobile devices that we have, often your phone or any sort of mobile device is going to be the right form factor. Right? And often as developers, it can be very hard to remember that because we use these devices as users, but when we're developing, we're typically building on a very powerful desktop or laptop machine. And so we, we have to always kind of re-encourage ourselves as a user, what am I doing to make these experiences great? And when as a user am I going to be wanting to use this device? Um, some of you in the conference might look a little bit more like this today, playing a little games. Um, but that really comes back to the idea of we're going to do what's easy for us, right? We're going to use these devices and we're going to engage as easily and as quickly as possible. And so I talk about this idea of uh, what I call barriers to engagement. So there, there's a gap between when you think about wanting to do something and when you're actually able to take action on that. So a, a few years ago, before I joined Google, actually, I was a big fan of the idea of Google Glass. And so I wore Google Glass for about three years. And the primary reason I wore it was because the barriers to engagement were virtually non-existent, right? So if you wanted to send a text message to your friend right now on your phone, you have to pull it out, you have to unlock it, and you have to launch an application, and then you choose what to do, right? And I, I've timed that on a number of people, and that takes about 14 seconds. Uh, whereas on a technology like Google Glass, that, that can take merely uh, under five seconds. And then if you compare that to a laptop or a desktop computer where I actually have to go somewhere physically and make that choice, uh, that can take much, much longer. And, and the importance between five seconds and 15 seconds doesn't seem like a lot, but it actually ends up being a really big deal because it actually changes the behaviors that we end up choosing to do. So because you're able to do something on your phone, like send a message, or respond quickly to an email, or check in on a stock price or something like that, you're actually going to be acting differently on those things than if, you, if there was a higher burden. And so you're able to more fluidly interact with technology, and hopefully more fluidly interact with the world. Uh, the second real important thing about mobile experiences is that you kind of have to go and meet your user where they are. right? Uh, Got long gone are the years where we could say, hey, I'm going to build an application. I'm going to say you have to use this version of the operating system, and you have to use this version of a framework, and then go and run these 17 install steps to go work an application. No, we have to go and meet users now, because the user's expectations are continuing to change. And this is where this term that I, I use, tyranny of the user, which is users' expectations are very high for us in terms of the applications and the experiences that we build for them, and they're not static. So the applications that you were building last year for mobile or for web, uh, they had a bar here. But this year, everyone is expecting those applications to do more, to be faster, even when they haven't necessarily gotten a faster device. And so trying to keep up with those users can be a, a big challenge. And that's something that we're trying to make easier uh, on the Angular team. Uh, another example of where this, this happens, this actually happened to me uh, last night in my hotel room. I exhausted two laptops worth of gigabit er, er, uh, internet in the hotel room. Because users on these mobile experiences don't have the same level of connectivity that we often expect, right? So at the conference here, the, I've actually found the internet to be quite good. Uh, but at my hotel, it was quite terrible. Uh, it was fast, but they cut me off after a gig. And so that prevented me from being uh, active in terms of the ways I wanted to engage with the world using technology. All right, so now the, the bulk of my, my talk here is going to be really about um, the different ways that the Angular ecosystem allows you to build these sorts of mobile experiences. So I'm going to talk about five. I'm going to talk about kind of more the pure web. So how do we build and launch applications that are targeting mobile devices? And then I'm going to talk about progressive web applications, which is a, a little bit more modern way of progressively enhancing the sites that you're delivering to your users. I'm going to talk about Cordova briefly. And then I'm going to touch on Ionic. And finally, I will come back to NativeScript, which takes a little bit of a different approach to how we build these experiences. So you may be asking, why only five? What about my framework of choice? What about all of the other ways that we can build and ship these experiences? Um, you're totally right. There are lots of other great ways to build applications. Uh, but this talk is finite, and the number of technology frameworks is infinite. So I cannot get to all of them in this talk. Um, so let's start, first start talking about uh, pure web or the mobile web experiences. So this is the idea that we're going to use the same technologies that we've had for a long time, the web browser, servers, and then JavaScript and HTML, and then build those experiences targeting a mobile user. And when you're targeting a mobile user, there's really kind of three things that you need to think about, right? They have a different level of network connectivity, they have less CPU, uh, and then they also have less memory on these devices. So all of these things are getting better with time, but as you saw in the example before, uh, 
there are always use cases where you lose these things and you don't have access to them when you need. And so one of the things to think about when building kind of these pure web experiences is how do I dog food my application? So this is a screenshot of a uh, application in the Chrome browser. Uh, if you open the dev tools, there's a, a nice little icon in the upper left hand corner that puts it into device mode. And so what this device mode does is it's going to change the form factor of the screen to a mobile device of your choosing. And then it's going to send all of the appropriate uh, user agent strings back to any sort of server or any, to any CSS media qu queries. Um, and then it's also going to do things like emulate uh, touch events differently, right? So instead of being a on mouse click, right, it's going to be an on touch or an on point uh, using the new pointer APIs. Um, there's two other things, really important things that you can do to help dog food your applications when you're thinking about targeting the mobile web. Uh, the first is network throttling. So over in the, the top right corner, you see no throttling right there. Um, as we all know, mobile devices, even when they have perfect access to internet connectivity, they're still going to be slower in terms of their network. And so you can actually simulate various levels, whether it's 3G, whether it's 2G, um, and then you can also simulate various levels of quality. So because not every HTTP request that you make is going to come back successfully, you, you probably want to emulate, hey, what if I only 90% of my requests come back successfully? Um, another thing that you can do in the timeline tab uh, in the dev tools uh, is you can actually emulate slower CPU. So not a lot of people know this, but if you click on timeline in the same upper right hand corner, you're going to see CPU level throttling. And you can throttle it back 2x, 5x, or whatever you need to for your CPU to understand, hey, my users have a fundamentally different experience than I do as a developer. How do I think about that, and how do I engage and take care of that? Um, Angular, when we think about the mobile web, the kind of the pure web, it makes the experiences on mobile devices is awesome for the same reason uh, that I feel like Angular makes the, the web in general awesome. Uh, the first is performance. So in, in terms of the shift from Angular 1 to Angular 2, uh, as a lot of you already know, uh, we move to a uh, directed component um, graph, basically. So we do a single change detection pass throughout your application. And then we can say, hey, we know that nothing else changed. There were no side effects of the change detection pass. Uh, and we can kind of be satisfied with that, which means it's really, really fast. And we, we've seen numbers from 5x to 10x for most applications. Um, and you really see this when you start getting thousands of uh, elements on a screen. So for example, if you're building a dashboard or some sort of visualization, uh, that ends up mattering a lot. Uh, the second thing I, I put on this list is the idea of material design. So Google came out with these design standards that they feel are pretty good uh, and are very cross-platform centric, right? So the idea is I want to have the same type of experience whether I'm building for mobile or desktop or laptop or any sort of touch interface or non-touch interface, right? It's the, a unified design language that makes building applications a little bit easier. Um, and uh, Angular, as you probably know, has an uh, Angular Material 2 project, which is has over 20 components right now, and is designed to make adopting and using those standards easy. Uh, third, we have a head of time compilation. Uh, so once again, not a lot of people knew this in Angular 1, but we actually had a compiler. Uh, but you, it was very small. It didn't have a lot of sophistication. But in Angular 2, the Angular compiler is, is relatively sophisticated. It can say, hey, your template didn't match up to some other thing, right? So uh, if you built an Angular 1 application, you'll often see these problems where uh, if you misname a variable, it'll just kind of fail silently. Um, and so we have a much more sophisticated compiler right now, um, but with that came a little bit of extra bundle size, and so uh, as well as the performance to interpret these templates uh, at runtime. And so in Angular 2, one of the things the, that is possible and that we highly recommend is the ahead of time compilation step, which is to say that at build time, instead of at runtime, you take all of your templates, all of your components, and you compile them into the JavaScript. And what we do is we take what was HTML, declarative HTML, and we turn it into all of the document.create elements uh, in a VM-optimized way that you can just ship that, and you can actually leave the compiler out of your bundle entirely. Um, and then the last advanced strategy that really makes uh, experiences great on mobile is the idea of using web workers. Uh, so if you're building any sort of web application, it's typically going to be single-threaded. Even though you're, you're doing all of these asynchronous calls, the JavaScript virtual machine is still uh, inlining basically all those things into a single thread. Um, but using a web worker can actually allow you to get out of that. And because of the idea that now Angular 2, we have DOM independence, we can run most of Angular in a web worker and then just propagate back the DOM updates that need to happen. And so that can give you this ability to process large amounts of data or to do very complex processing without interrupting the UI thread, right? So without preventing user input from being successful. Uh, we, I also want to give a, a sneak peek at something that we're evaluating and we're, something we're thinking about possibly doing here, um, which is the idea of adding our own um, layouts 
library or um, module, which would be a collection of directives, uh, very similar to what we had in year one, that would allow you to uh, lay things out and basically uh, be a wrapper on top of Flexbox to make it easier to position elements and make things uh, flow as you want them to. Um, but the other thing that we can do, because this would be li live uh, in Angular and have uh, really be components and directives and templates, uh, is the idea that we can make it more of an active responsiveness. So instead of just letting CSS and letting the visuals change, we could theoretically say, hey, if I'm on a mobile form factor, um, maybe we don't show some components, right? So that if you flip your screen and when the screen resolution changes, we can take a more active understanding of what that means within your application and then propagate that back to you. The next piece that I want to talk about as part of the ecosystem is the idea of progressive web applications. How many people here have built a progressive web application? Okay, a couple. Um, so to understand progressive web applications, I think it re it's really important to go back to what do users expect and what are users really hoping for. Uh, every user, they want an icon for your application or website on their home screen, right? because they don't want to go launch a browser and then figure out how to get to your site. Uh, and bookmarks are not very easily exposed or readily available on mobile. Uh, they want notifications, because uh, applications aren't just living when the user is interacting with them, but they typically they're being driven by services that are running all of the time. And so how do we enable them to be a little bit more reactive, uh, responsive, instead of just being proactive in terms of having to launch the application in order to do it? Uh, and then lastly, uh, users want your application to work offline. Right? We, we've, I've come back to this a few times already, but the idea that my network connection is going to be unreliable, and I need to take ownership and control of that in order to build a great experience. So progressive web apps handle these three things in a number of different ways. Uh, the first is, and, and a lot of this is going to be Android specific, um, but uh, excuse, you know, Chrome Android specific, but I think it's coming to Firefox, and I think I personally have high hopes that someday it will come to iOS. Uh, but the first thing is a install banner. So right now, on an Android device using Chrome, if you pull up a progressive web application that has itself registered in this way uh, several times over a period of time, and you indicate to the browser that, hey, I actually care about the site, I'm a repeat visitor, uh, a little pop-up will come up at the bottom that will allow the user to say, hey, this application has more functionality and can be a better experience if you install this to the uh, home screen of your device. And so this is the, the browser's way of giving you those deeper hooks into the application from the operating system level. Um, at the heart of a progressive web application is what's called a service worker. Uh, it's a little bit like a web worker, which is just a, a basic kind of second thread with message passing, um, but it's on steroids a little bit. So uh, service workers actually get a number of additional capabilities that web workers don't have. Uh, first and foremost, service workers allow you to implement basically a proxy within your application that handles all of the network traffic. So that means instead of when your application launches automatically going out to the network to get all of your assets and all of your data, you can actually intercept those requests and say, hey, I'm going to decide based on the, whether or not the user has in internet connectivity and based on the current state of the application, how do I want to respond to those things? And so one of the most common patterns that we see is the idea that, hey, I'm going to take all of my assets in my application, right, my JavaScript bundle, my HTML, my pictures, and I'm going to just store those in the cache within the service worker so that when that user clicks on the icon or tries to visit my website, even if the internet connection is unreliable, uh, I'm still going to be able to respond to those things. And not only is it an offline concern, but it's also a performance concern. Because if we're serving from the local disk of the, the phone or the device, we're actually able to get um, much, much faster response times. The second thing that a, a service worker can do for you is, as I said, it can register for notifications. So this means that your application can actually wake up and run your processes when a user has not taken a proactive action. Right? So this is the standard paradigm that we've had in mobile for a long time of the ability to um, respond to an event that's happened on a server and then engage the user and say, hey, this thing's happened. What do you want to do about that? Um, so personally, for example, I'm a, a big Facebook user. And about six months ago, I actually uninstalled the Facebook application because the Facebook application on mobile is actually good enough now that you don't need the uh, native mobile application. You can almost use the web application for everything. And so what that means is I don't need the disk on my phone anymore. I don't have any sort of battery implications of this uh, application sitting and running in the background sometimes. Uh, but I still get that same sort of experience because I'm able to access all of the application functionality. Uh, and I still get all of the notifications when a friend mentions, mentions me, for example. 
Um, PWAs are a really exciting piece of technology, and they are really designed to progressively enhance an application, right? So if you don't have a phone or a device that supports PWAs, your website is still going to function great, but it's a way of adding extra, right? It's a way of building that engagement where it's available, uh, with the hope being that it's going to be available more and more places with time. Um, but if you go to this URL, chrome colon slash slash service worker dash internals on a, a Chrome browser on your device, you'll actually see that there are a number of service workers probably already installed on your device. And so I, I looked uh, very recently at my device, appear in Twitter, weather.com, Duolingo. These were all web applications that I'd been using that had installed something to my device. And as a user, I didn't really know that they had done that, but maybe I'd seen in the past a pop-up saying, hey, would you like to allow notifications? Or maybe they're doing some level of offline caching that I, as a user, don't have to think about, but still benefits me at the end of the day. And so I, I encourage everyone after this, this talk, uh, pull up that URL and see how many service workers are already installed on your, your uh, device, how many applications are already doing this sort of in progressive enhancement. Um, Angular, when it comes to progressive web applications, uh, we make this awesome because we, we do a couple things. Uh, the first is what we call app shell creation. So um, we, we gave a demo at Google I.O. Uh, earlier this year where uh, via a set of directives that you put on your templates, right? So you say app shell on any of your HTML elements that you want. We will actually then use Angular Universal to pre-render a version of that application um, with just those elements. Because a huge part of building great web applications, especially with progressive web apps and service worker, is this idea of performance and speed. We want the first time to first paint to be as low as possible. And we want to have this nice experience that sh maybe it starts with the right colors and the right shapes on your screen. and then loads with data as we get more connectivity and we, as we get more data. And so we'll automatically generate that app shell that loads very quickly and looks good uh, for you. Uh, and then the second part is a uh, Webpack plugin that actually automatically creates the service worker for you that will sh uh, cache and ship all of these assets to your users. So more to come on that uh, in the, the coming weeks and months. Uh, the next uh, ecosystem component that I want to talk about is the idea of Cordova. So Cordova's been around for a while, and what Cordova basically does is it takes your web applications and it runs them on a phone inside of a web view. But the thing that it does that, that really helps build good experiences is that it gives you JavaScript APIs and mobile APIs for all of the things that a phone can do. So when you think about all the things that, that I might want to do on a phone, uh, there's camera, there's file system, there's databases. There, there's kind of tens of these different APIs. And while most of these are coming to the web in the term, in uh, kind of pure ECMAScript style, uh, such as uh, I think the camera API in particular has gotten a lot better over the last couple of versions uh, in terms of being able to point to a, a file input and saying, hey, I need a picture. Take it from the camera, for example. Um, not all of those things are available, and they're not available to all devices. So when you think about reaching the largest audience, Cordova can be a big win because it can give you access to those things uh, even on older devices. And there, there's even a project called Crosswalk that will allow you to ship and bundle your own web view so that you can be 100% certain that they, uh, the browser that your user is using matches the one that you're testing and developing with. Um, another thing that you can do with Cordova is you can actually mix and match it with native components. Um, uh, excuse me, native uh, kind of Java, iOS elements. So think of a, an example architecture where you take a native application uh, targeting iOS or Android or, or whatever platform you want. Maybe you want to build a native authentication step and login, right? So you get that uh, very smooth first touch experience uh, pulling in Facebook API, Google APIs, things like that for that login flow. Uh, but then I also want to expose the settings natively. Uh, but then for the rest of my application, I want to share that code with the, the back end of my web application, right? You can then just embed a Cordova uh, web view in that part of your application and kind of ha the, the handoff will happen seamlessly. So if you're looking to get started with Cordova, it's relatively simple. Uh, all these examples are going to require NPM. So based on the number of hands that have, uh, are familiar with Angular, I, I won't go into NPM very much here. Uh, but you install Cordova globally, uh, and then you can create a new application, Cordova create app-name. Um, and this is something that, that I've done uh, before and we'll get into in the live demo. And then I'll show you the, the next steps um, and how easy it is to kind of extend that and connect that to an Angular application. Uh, Angular applications, I, I think, and, and this really applies to any uh, single page applications or SPAs, uh, they're inherently architected in a way that really matches the mobile paradigm. So any single page application that you build 
already knows for the most part about the content that it's going to be loading. It can say, hey, I want all these assets up front. Uh, and then it knows how the user is going to flow through an application. And it takes control of most of the navigation paradigms. Uh, and that fits very well with a, a, a mobile application uh, mindset because that's the same thing that that's doing. Uh, the next one I want to talk about is Ionic. So Ionic is actually a, a project from a, an awesome team that, that can, visits us out in Mountain View um, regularly. Uh, it, they are built on top of Cordova. So Ionic is uh, a few different things. So first and foremost, uh, the, the first exposure a lot of people are going to have is their CLI. So Ionic has their own CLI that allows you to uh, build and run applications. They also have their own build environment, um, as well as kind of this set of backend services that try and make it easier to do things like authentication or anything that requires a server. Um, Cordova can sometimes be a little bit messy in terms of the, the raw power that it gives you when it exposes all the, the mobile APIs, uh, as well as its own build process. Uh, Ionic does a really good job of extracting those things um, and making it so that you don't have to deal with um, necessarily some of the problems that Cordova is going to uh, throw at you. The other nice thing about Ionic is it was actually built for Angular. So it was originally built uh, for Angular 1, and now uh, it's got fantastic support for Angular 2. And so what that means is all of the paradigms that are going to be used in Ionic, and when you build an Ionic application, are directly related to and, and work perfectly with this idea of building an Angular application. And so uh, part of that, and a great example of that, is the fact that Ionic has a set of components. And so they have actually one of the, the largest UI libraries uh, in terms of components uh, that are out there. So a lot of people use Bootstrap and things like that. Uh, Bionic can be also a, a fantastic choice. So this is an example where they've gone and done all of the work necessary for uh, your application. If you use their components, it's going to render native-like on iOS, Android, um, and other platforms. So here we have an ion list, which is their kind of list view. Uh, and then they've got an ion list header. And then they've got ion items. And so this is a checkbox that not only looks a little bit iOS and a little bit Android on both platforms, uh, but also behaves like those platforms, right? So uh, matching these user expectations on mobile is a huge part of being successful. Uh, Ionic was really designed for mobile experiences uh, for, built from the ground up using Angular. So when you think about Ionic, uh, you really want to imagine yourself building, first and foremost, a mobile application uh, that is going to be cross-platform. It's going to use the web technologies, so all of those components, they are still rendering uh, to DOM at some level, um, and then running in a web view for, for your users. The, the final player in the ecosystem that I want to talk about is NativeScript. So I, I'm a big fan of NativeScript because they, they've taken the traditional how do we apply web technologies approach um, and bring them to mobile, and they, they've tweaked them a little bit, and they do them a little bit differently. So NativeScript really leverages or allows you to leverage the Angular platform. So you're building an application uh, in Angular, uh, for example, in the same way that you'd build any other application. So you get the same change detection. You still get the same graph of components. You can still use modules in the same way. So all of the, the learning that you're familiar with with Angular uh, works. But then instead of rendering to DOM and instead of rendering to HTML elements, they're actually doing native rendering. And so uh, I have an example of this, if my clicker it's almost out of power. Um, so to use NativeScript, you're actually going to do npm install NativeScript, just like we saw with uh, pretty much everything else here. Uh, and then I'm going to use TNS, which is their uh, CLI, uh, and create an application. And then you can throw the dash dash ng flag. Um, and so what that actually looks like under the hood, if you're building an Angular application, this, this should look very familiar to you. right? So we've got the at component decorator. You've got the selector. So this is how we do component composition in Angular. Um, and then instead of a template that has HTML, they've actually built a, uh, instead of a DOM renderer, they've actually built a native renderer. And so what that does is it takes these elements, and instead of running, uh, spinning up a web view within a mobile application, it's actually uh, instantiating widgets uh, from iOS. So if you've got a text field, it'll uh, instantiate the right iOS widget, instantiate the right Android widget based on the platform. Uh, same with uh, their entire kind of component library. But the, the important difference to note here is that, once again, this looks like HTML and uses HTML syntax. Um, but fundamentally, you are not running a browser. You are not uh, going through that DOM layer because of Angular's DOM independence. So Angular really makes NativeScript awesome by letting you build Angular apps. So, so this idea that you can use all the skills you know um, to target these native UI elements in a way that, that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do. 
So I've presented kind of these five options that have relatively different uh, implications, both for experience and for uh, development capabilities. And so I have a set of principles that I want you to think through when you're trying to make these decisions. Uh, first and foremost, come back to meet users where they are, right? So if you are have user expectations that are, are one way or another, you have to think about those things. So an example of this is quality of interaction. If I'm building a highly transactional retail application, the expectations are different for my users than if I'm building a line of business application, right? In a line of business application, maybe startup time is less important because I'm going to sit there for eight hours a day using this device, um, whereas maybe in a transactional uh, startup time is more important and the interactions don't actually need to be as performant. And so when you think about the speed of performance, you can actually achieve really high performance and really good interactivity, 60 frames per second, with really any of these approaches. Um, but it's sometimes going to be easier if you use something like native script because then you're relying more on the mobile platform for handling the rendering. Um, and then another principle to think about is the idea of code reuse. Um, all of the developers in the room here, you all have hundreds and thousands of features and bugs that you could be fixing right now. But minimizing the amount of work that you, or uh, maximizing the amount of work that you don't do should be one of your biggest challenges or uh, opportunities and, and goals, right? Because if you can develop faster, then your product is probably going to be more successful, right? You can build more things, you can build better things. Um, and then I was, I was speaking with a Fortune 500 company last week, and I was actually surprised to hear that they were using uh, Cordova to actually ship applications for iOS, Android, um, for kind of hundreds of thousands of users, and they didn't have a single Mac across the team. So that, that, that struck me because I, I've always been, you, you kind of have to have a Mac and you have to have a Windows PC if you want to hit Windows devices and if you want to hit iOS devices and you want to hit Android. You kind of have to have this cross-section of devices for development. Um, but they were actually so reliant um, and so trusting in what Cordova and what uh, a company, for example, called Phone, PhoneGap was able to provide that they would build their application, they would do all the appropriate testing, they had all the, the appropriate unit testing and end-to-end -end testing doing cross-browser. But then, the, to actually get the IPA, to actually get the binary that they were using on mobile, uh, they were just relying on PhoneGap to do all of that, that build step. And that, that was huge right, for them because they didn't have to go and learn mobile. Right? They didn't have to go figure out how do I use Xcode and how do I, I handle all these provisioning profiles. They were just relying on someone else to handle that, which was a, a big deal for them. Um, the other thing I, I want you to think about is, it's 2016. Um, there was a, a brief period where uh, and this was probably two, three years ago, where you could ship a mobile application and not have a web experience. But once again, it comes back to that idea of tyranny of the users. Users kind of expect more. If you look at all of the best of breed, kind of large scale mature applications, they're gonna end up having both a web experience and some sort of installed mobile. Um, and in a lot of use cases, uh, you'll still see, even if you build the best installed mobile experience possible, you're still gonna see 70% of your users using that web experience because people are gonna send a link, right? I'm gonna have just switched phones and maybe I don't have the app installed yet. And so I'm always gonna, uh, or often gonna end up on that mobile website. And so if we can deliver a great experience for them, uh, that's great, right? So you're already building these things. If you can take advantage of that and ship the same code into a different form factor and get that installed mobile, that can be a huge win. Um, the web is also really important when it comes to transactional interactions. So think about the way that your users are going to be touching these applications because everyone kind of thinks that they want an installed mobile application, um, but do they really need one, right? Because if you're only coming in for short transactions, maybe a once a year type of thing, right? My, my dentist, I'm probably not going to go install my dentist's application. So if they can build a great web experience, maybe that's, that's the right answer for them. Uh, and then as I said before, there is a huge psychological perception uh, bump to this idea of being in the app stores and being on the, the home screen of a device. Uh, there was a, a, a term that was being thrown around a few years ago, am I home screen worthy, right? And we all want to be building good enough applications that are home screen worthy. Um, and so thinking about whether or not uh, you are home screen worthy and how to become that way can be a real important guide to deciding okay, what sort of technology should we be using to build this and how do we want to build it. Uh, and then lastly is think about the skill sets and the developers on your team. So this is a picture of uh, the Angular team and a bunch of contributors uh, in London a few weeks ago. And so 
does your team already have web development skills, right? Are they Java server faces developer, JSP developers that have been building HTML and shipping HTML for a long time? Maybe it's going to be easier for them to take advantage of things like uh, progressive web apps and just this pure web experience than it is to take advantage of something like native script. All right, so now we're going to get into a little bit of live coding. So our mission here is uh, basically from scratch. I've just skipped the, the network intensive parts. We're going to try and build a responsive web application and make it installable uh, using Angular. And so I'll, I'll walk us through as we go here. So I've done two steps uh, prior to this. So I've run uh, npm install on the Angular CLI. So npm install dash g Angular dash CLI. And I created a, a brand new project, uh, which I called MWA uh, for mobile web app. Um, and so this has scaffolded out a very basic uh, application using the CLI. So if you uh, run ng-new, which is our, our CLI command to create a new Angular project, uh, this is what you'd actually get. So let's go up to demo, MWA, and let's open that. And let's make sure you guys can all see it. All right, so this is the, the default scaffolding that you're going to get with a Angular application. So uh, you've got all of the, the build things that you need, all the configuration things, and then testing, unit testing. Uh, index.html, and then up here in our source slash app folder, we've got really the heart of our Angular 2 application. Uh, and so I'm going to follow a few steps here that, uh, to build out this application. So the first thing I'm going to do is we want to make this application look OK, or, or maybe even good. Uh, I'm not a great designer, so lower, lower your expectations just a little bit. Um, but in order to use Material Design, I need to install Material. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to import or improt, whichever it comes out. Excuse me. I'm going to import material module from Angular slash material. So once again, this was one of the uh, NPM installs that I ran before. And then I'm going to add that to my ng module. And I'm going to call dot for root to make sure that we get all of the providers that we need for that. All right, so with those two lines, I've now basically installed Angular material within my application. Um, and then the, the last step I need to do to install it is I'm actually going to copy and paste this CSS, which does a couple things. If I can find my styles.css here. Uh, first, we're importing the default uh, theme for Angular Material, which is called, I think, Deep Purple uh, Amber. Uh, and then I'm just clearing up some of the styles, so getting rid of the, the kind of default margin and padding. Uh, and then I'm giving a, a little bit of margin so that our, our application doesn't look terrible here. So let me give that a save. And in the background, one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to run uh, ng-serve. And so this is our command uh, at the command line that goes and pulls into your, your entire application, does all the bundling steps, and then spins up a web server, and then watches your application for changes. So this should say bundle is valid. And then we should be able to pull up in our browser here, localhost 4200. And we should get app works. All right, so we have a very basic application. So let's, let's give it a name now, actually. So I'll call this Cordova demo. All right. So we, we have an application now. Uh, it runs. It works because of the CLI. It's got any, uh, material design. But we're not actually using any material design components. So first, let's go ahead into our HTML. And I'm going to swap out these H1s for MD toolbar. And I'm going to tell it that it, I want it to be colored primary. And this is, once again, coming from that theme. So hopefully what was just plain text should turn into a nice purple bar here. Very nice. All right, and then the second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start adding some content. So maybe I want to do a list of people on the Angular team that I might need to call at a moment's notice. So I'm going to create a variable called people, uh, and I'm going to put in a, an array of objects here. And so we'll just have someone's name. So we'll have Igor here, and then we'll have a description for them. Come see Igor's talk later today at DevOx. And I'll just quickly add a couple more people. We'll say Mishko. So we'll give him the description of founder, awesome guy, AKA Papa Mishko. And then we'll throw in maybe Alex. What a great developer and person. And then I'll throw last here, Rob, and give him a description of uh, always able to answer any question you have. 
All right, so now we have that array of people. Let's go ahead and start rendering that out. So I'm gonna use a material design card for this. So I'm gonna say MD card. And then I'm gonna make an MD card for every item in that array. So I'm gonna use an ng4 loop. I'm gonna say let people or person of people. Hopefully my variable is called people here. Uh, and then in there, let's just start off by saying the person's name. So as I said, it's watching all of the changes that I make and then it's recompiling them in the background. So we should see a material design card here with each of those people. All right, perfect. So we've got Igor, Mishko, Alex, and Rob. Um, but now I want to actually expose the, the rest of the, the information about them. And so I'm going to go ahead and add a few other things here. So in the MD card, I'm going to add an MD, I believe it is called title, but I just want to double check. MD card header, excuse me. And I'm going to put the name in there. And then I'm going to have an MD card content. So these, these are optional parts to the material design library for uh, material design cards that you can use. So I'll show their description. And then I also want you to be able to call that person. So I'm going to make a, a fake little button here called MD card actions. And in there, I'm going to, what's that? So, thank you. And so that's actually funny. So we are working on something called language services right now. Um, that are extending the HTML understanding uh, and adding semantic understanding. So uh, you should see that soon, hopefully, where this will actually uh, use all of its understanding of your models, so your, your components associated with this HTML, uh, and then actually render out, hey, this is not a valid property of uh, your object. So that's coming soon. It's very cool. Uh, we're just trying to make it good before we release it. Uh, and then in here, let's make a button, and we'll make this one MD raised and we'll call it call. All right, if I didn't make any other typos when we save, this should refresh in the background, um, and it should give us some relatively nice looking cards. Perfect, so we have Igor, Mishko, Alex, and Rob. And you can see, uh, because we're using material design, if I pop into developer mode here, um, this still looks pretty good, right? This, this looks mobile optimized. Um, it doesn't necessarily follow iOS or Android standards, but it does follow Google's material design, which is really designed to be cross-platform. Um, so from here, what I want to do is now we have a working application, theoretically, um, and it works. I'm going to actually go ahead now and build this out to a, a bundle, and then I'm going to load that within Cordova. So I need to make one tweak in my index.html that allows Cordova's weird file name rewriting to work. Uh, and then I'm going to go in my second tab here, and I'm going to kill the ng serve, and I'm going to run ng build dash dash prod dash dash aot. And so this is instead of serving it live, it's going to go ahead and do a production build. So it's going to minify, it's going to strip out all the comments, things like that, uh, and then it's going to store that in my slash uh, dist folder, uh, which is the the default for the CLI. And so on the other tab here, what I'm going to do is I've already uh, I just uh, Cordova create. So if you remember that command. I, I ran Cordova create and it created this folder. Um, and in here, uh, it's got a bunch of different things. So a config file, so I just added the name um, DevOx Mobile. And then everything else here was scaffolded for me, uh, including a www file, which I'm actually gonna blow away right now. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna link directly to that uh, MWA slash dist folder as the www folder. And so what this is, is this is a default Cordova application with a, a name that I gave to it pointed now to the build folder of an Angular application that wasn't really designed necessarily to be uh, installed mobile, but we should be able to make it installed mobile anyway. Uh, and then I just have to do one more thing because Cordova does not like gzip files for some reason. I have to remove the gzip files. So now if I run Cordova run Android, so uh, I already have the Android emulator and SDK set up here. Um, Cordova run Android. It should take that uh, distributed package bundled Angular application and now embed it within an ang uh, Android application and then run that on my emulator. So let's go ahead and take a look at my emulator and see if it's there. There it is. So now we have a mobile application running on Android. Uh, this could run on iOS just as well uh, with the same kind of visuals that we saw in the responsive web. But now a user can take that, we can put this in the app store, we can, a user can install it and they can access all of that uh, those additional APIs that Cordova provides. I'm 
All right. So that was the, the live demo. So as I said, we, we built an application for Angular that was responsive because of our use of material design, and then we shipped it into the Play Store. Uh, so that was the, the last section here. Um, I will be posting all of the uh, slides here and the source code on Twitter later. So if you want to follow me, at Stephen Fluen, uh, S-T-P-H-E-N, uh, that will all be available. Um, and then I think uh, we have a little bit of time for questions. So if anyone wanted to ask a question, uh, you can come up to the microphone there on the left, uh, or you can come up and ask me after. Thank you guys so much.